Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Fox Creek Mayor Sheila Gilmore. The municipality of Fox Creek is a bustling hotbed of economic activity. Also known for its bountiful wilderness, Fox Creek showcases the very best of the surrounding forests, lakes, and wildlife, making it the perfect location for outdoor enthusiasts. Fox Creek merges as a serene wilderness experience with small town hospitality, first class amenities, and a reliable service center for visitors, forestry, and the active oil and gas industry. Fox Creek is a great place to call home. So stay tuned as we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Sheila Gilmore. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the person behind the mayor's title for a little bit, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Um, that one is, uh, I work with the public um, and have for 20 some years. I'm a hairstylist, own my own salon. Um, in our small community and I just always was hearing and thinking about how is council making those decisions what is their reasoning behind this there must be a reason behind because you know you you only find out their their final decisions if you don't go uh, and so I decided that it would be great to stand up and have my voice heard but not just my voice the the voice of everybody else who um, maybe doesn't have or the ability or is or wants to um, have their voice heard for their community. So I decided that it would be great to put my name forward and represent the people. Um, I'm there because of them. So I, I did a little bit of research on you because I, I like to learn a little bit about the electoral history of my guests prior to talking yep. to them. So the very first election I found that you ran in is 2017. Is that correct? It is. This is my okay. second term. First second term as mayor. There you go. So that's yep. the question I want to ask here. Because you, you were elected as a councillor in 2017. You were acclaimed as mayor in 2021. Um, yes. But you were the incumbent mayor in 2021 when you ran. So was there an appointment during that first term that you got appointed to become mayor? Or did you run uh, as as a mayor and just no one else challenged you in 2021? Just yes. circle the pegs here for me for a second, okay. Sheila. So um, I was... Um... Uh, I was acclaimed as mayor because no one ran against me. Um, one of our former mayor, um, he actually decided to run um, for council. Instead, we kind of just flip flop positions. So I was never an interim mayor. Um, I was just the, um, we went from one to the other during, after the election. Okay, perfect. 
thank you so much for that clarification because i was trying to figure that out i just couldn't couldn't figure out all the details here so I, i've got to ask what was it about the municipal level of government that drove you to it because we are a municipal show we always try to learn why people get involved in municipally you talked about your duty to serve and giving back to the community was there something going on in 2017 that you decided that you wanted to get involved because you could have chosen 2013 you could have waited until 2021 what was it about that election in 2017 that made sheila finally stand up and say okay it's time to put my name on the ballot and make a difference for the community two things um i actually had thought about it in 2013 but it wasn't right the timing for my family um when you decide to put your name forward in a small municipality, I'm assuming large as well, um, your family is a big part of it. They have to be supportive as well. And they were very supportive of me, but we still had children in high school. And I spent a lot of time um, volunteering at the school and in their activities and clubs. So for me, 2013 wasn't the right time to be able to dedicate the time needed to um for municipal government so 2017 came um children are graduated uh all but one and um it was just the right time then in the 2013 election i had talked to one of our previous mayors um and really dove into how much time do i need to give to be successful in the position of um council and so looking at that, looking at my family and what I wanted to give to, to my family and my community and the school in that way was, uh, it just wasn't the right time. So 2017 came and it was the right time for our family and myself, and it was the right time to get involved um, and see what difference I could actually make in the community for the people. You get elected at a very unique time in history because A, you get elected in 2017 as a counselor, global pandemic hits. We don't expect that ever to hit, but it hits. Um, and then you're elected mayor. And then last year, literally almost a year ago, this uh, year, almost a year ago, Fox Creek is evacuated through a wildfire. Um, it's been a challenging t a year, term and a half, I should say. Uh, how are you doing? I've got to ask that sort of uh, odd question, but it's an important question. How, how have you dealt with this last few, almost six years of these uncertain times that we're living in? So being um, that I wanted to have my voice heard for the people and be able to help make those decisions, um, in term one, when COVID hit and all of that unknown, that was um, some of the hardest uh, decisions that I felt we had to make, um, trying to make decisions when for your municipality and what to do. So that was extremely challenging. Um, COVID was definitely the hardest. Last year during evacuation, um, it was really interesting. At first it was like, okay, this is happening and it's a lot. And then as the time went through, um, it was, we were probably about day four in where everything kind of for myself was, I knew that's where I needed to be. I wanted to be elected to have a voice for the people and to support and help them through um, municipal government. And during the evacuation, it was the time where I felt like I could be really be there for them and be strong and help them through and in any way that I could be it just a smile, be it a hug, be it that, you know, here's the information you need to try to help yourself and your family um, advocate for them. And with those higher level uh, government with the province and seeing and getting answers where I could and just really trying to be there supportively and have that role. Again, I'm always gonna go back to this one in um, the time where this became right for me to go in this position. I have an extremely supportive family that supports me. So during the evacuation, I felt extremely supported by my family. So it was very easy for me to be in the role to try to help them. Was it an easy time? No. Were we going through something that was very unprecedented, yes. Uh, worst wildfire season on history. Our community was out for 19 days and trying to 
be able to tell the tell people when they're asking, are we going to be able to go home and you just don't know? It was a challenge. Um, so yeah, so it's been um, a term and a half has, we've gone through a lot um, as council and, and myself as mayor and then as a councillor previous. Um, and it's just really been something that I chalk up to. I have great support and it's a time in history we'll never forget. Now, I, I can imagine you've had to make some tough choices outside of those two glo uh, two major, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say issues, but major events, wildfire and COVID-19. You have to make tough decisions on a day-to-day -day basis because you are the closest to the people. You impact people probably the most compared to the other two levels of government, the federal and the provincial government. When you walk into that council table, that council chambers, and you have to sit down and make those tough choices, how important is it for you to be prepared on the issues, read the agenda package, but not be cemented in the idea that you're going to vote one way because you have to hear from potential other councillors, delegations, public hearings, who may be able to sway your decision making or may make you think a different way than you had originally thought about an issue. You kind of nailed it right there with that last bit is that um, I try to keep an open mind. I There's been numerous times that I've gone in thinking, oh, this is what I actually support. And you do hear from those counselors that have a very different opinion and a very valid opinion. And I honestly believe and have for years that you need to really hear people. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them. And you can totally take what they have to say and listen. So I just pride myself in being open, willing to change and um, roll with it. I am extremely prepared when I go into the council meeting. I will read my agenda packages. I will um, try to find out past history even of our, of our community and try to figure out why decisions were made the way they were so that we can make that change, but really being open. Um, to hearing the other part. I really enjoy our council. There's seven of us. We all come from very different parts of the community and really represent our community well. And I really enjoy that because, you know, maybe councillor this or councillor that has an opinion they brought forward and we can really change. We can make that change and you go with it. And I'm also a big supporter of, even if I still say I'm going to vote this way, I 100% um, support the decision that is democracy and we go with it. How important is it because you talk about hearing from all sides and respectfully hearing from all sides. How important is it that if a decision is made at council, you communicate to people because I, I, I'm going to assume here and you know, you should never assume, but I'm going to assume <laughs> here for a second that you've come to the realization that you're not pleasing 100% of the people in your community with every decision oh, yeah. you make. <laughs> <laughs> for those 100%. who are not watching this the eye roll that i just got in, in agreement with that statement how oh, important yeah. how important is it to communicate to the residents on all issues like even those that you think are getting a unanimous support across the the town there's always going to be people who just don't agree with a, a, an issue that you have brought forward or a direction that the council is moving how important is it to have that respectful dialogue to give everyone a chance to a have your ear for five ten minutes but also inform them that this is the reason why we're moving forward in this direction um, it's extremely important. Um, we do try to make, as you said, we try to make a decision that will um, be best for the whole community as a whole, because we're not serving just one person, we're serving everyone. We're all unique. But I really actually like to talk to the residents and find out why they are opposed to a decision we made, because it's another avenue to hear um, why they think it's that way or I have their ear to give them an explanation of why did we choose this? So it can go both ways where I might be able to better explain why we chose to go that way, or they might give me an actual valid reason of, who maybe we shouldn't have made that decision. And I will always have the philosophy of we're making the best decision with the information we have at the time, like most councils are, but that is a really, hard one because sometimes afterwards light information comes to light 
but we're also a council and myself, I will pride myself if we've made the wrong decision. And let me tell you, we have made wrong decisions in our community. Um, we'll rectify them if we can. Engagement comes with uh, your the responsibilities of a, a mayor, of a council, of a council as a whole. Engaging the community, and I, I used to work up in the northern Alberta with four municipalities, so I know engagement is a priority for a lot of small town mayors and councils. But in my opinion, and this is my opinion, for those who are about to send emails to the mayor, please don't, because this is my opinion, and I'm <laughs> going to ask the question after this. Um, in my opinion, I see that there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics and municipal governance today, whether people just, as long as the water's turned on, as the garbage is picked up, we're comfortable with what's going on at City Hall or Town Hall. Um in Fox Creek, do you get people who are actually engaged who want to give you your feed, their feedback on issues that are pertinent to the municipality and how the municipality should be directed, or is there sort of a, a, a sort of an unknown apathy that's going on in Fox Creek? Um, they like to. Um, in this day and age, of course, a lot of stuff comes across on different platforms that you find out <laughs> information on. Um, I think that most people in the community, because we we are a small community, um, most people will, um, I'm going to say it's 50-50 or maybe a little more where people don't necessarily care as long as the garbage is picked up and the water is turned on. But they sometimes, the things they care about would surprise you where it's something that is minor, where there's a change in billing. They don't like a new format. Um, that, that is a concern that's going on in our community right now with our utility bills we've sent out. It's different. We've had a few issues. Uh, uh, I am a firm believer of directing things um, being straightforward and, you know, there's some change. So they don't like those things versus bigger ticket items where you think you might have a lot more people come forward with concern. Um, so it is different. I might, I myself have always prided myself on being approachable if you can and come to, directly talk to me um, about an issue. What about the jurisdictional role of the municipality when they do come talk to you? Are you finding that more and more people are because after uh, the global pandemic and after even a wildfire situation, uh, the municipality is responsible for a, a select amount of things at the end of the day. But the average person, they they know who you are. They may not know who their MLA is. They may not know who their MP is, but they know who you are at the end of the day. How many times are you finding that more and more people are approaching you as the mayor and as council on issues that are not of in the jurisdictional purview of the municipality, but rather federal or provincial? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, part of our thing is with the MD people not understanding directly how, how it works because we are part of the MD, but we're our own municipality. And that one is the hardest one for our community. Um, we're extremely fortunate. Um, I'm going to say a huge po portion of our population does know our MLA. He's very, um, he's been our MLA for quite a while. So a lot of people know him and he's at a lot of our, our uh, um, events and things. So we're very fortunate to be able to Who's see Who's your ours. MLA, if you don't mind me asking? Is uh, Minister Todd Lowen. Oh, Todd. Okay. 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 okay sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so he's ours. Um, our member of parliament, um, some people might recognize who he is because he also does try to hit up. Um, he's usually at our Canada Day Parade um, and a few other events through the year that he can make it to. But I would say majority would not know him. It's the MD and they want to know why the MD, you know, sometimes why does the MD have this stuff going on for, for their hamlets, but not us. They don't understand that it's like we are our own municipality that's the hard one um because we are fortunate that uh, we are part of the md of greenview and they are very good to us um but we also are our own entity and explaining that to them that's the hard one for them understandable um we're talking about some issues now, and I want to preface this conversation by saying okay. this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is just <laughs> the mayor's opinion. For those who are about to send their emails saying that this does not match up with what's going on at City Hall, please note this is 
an interview and it's her opinion. They may match up. I'm not sure. That's the great thing about interviews. Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Fox Creek today? Uh, a couple things. So we are a small municipality. Um, we are one of a few in Alberta that are a little more um, isolated. We are on the major highway, right? We're on Highway 43, but we're 45 minutes on either side of us. We have no farming land around us. It's forest um, and uh, oil field. So we tend to have struggle, like many places, to get services to come here. And we're also one of those corner spots where this happens everywhere, but we're on the edge of this or the edge of that. And so getting those services um, that we might need where you have easier access to get them or your next municipality over is only 10, 15 minutes. So driving down the highway isn't always an option for people to be able to go to White Court or other places to get that. So that is a huge obstacle um, for our community. And we, we struggle with um, our population is, hasn't grown a lot over the last years. Um, but we have a huge shadow population that doesn't get to be counted on our census. Um, and we, then they require services and they put strain on services that we do have in our community, but we're not allowed to count them for funding. So that has always been something that Fox Creek has dealt with. Um, we are a very busy community, but we're a very, we're a small community. So I want to, I want to talk about the services first if you don't mind okay. what does the municipality do in the short term to address some of these issues because you're right reliable access to health care reliable services in your community is a priority for all municipalities not just fox creek but all yeah. smaller or smaller and i say rural in the sense because you are an urban center but you are in a rural setting um yeah. What What is the municipality doing now to address some of these issues, to bring some of these services to Fox Creek so you don't have someone driving on the highway down to White Court or up to Valley View or even to Edmonton to access some of the services that they would wish were in their own community? Um, so we have a CRC, a Community Resource Center, that um, they try to facilitate what they can they are limited. Uh, we just like a lot of rural municipalities in Alberta did receive um, a rural transportation grant. So we're working on that as well um, and working out the details of what that will look like to be able to get people to the spots they need. Um, and just, re just like most municipalities, really trying to see who has what for abilities to maybe be able to help the other person in the community. And um, we have volunteer driver programs. So that is keep getting them on the highway, but at least they that we have a program where we can help people. Um, we're very fortunate with the support that we have from the oil industry. They bring in different things or donate stuff to our community as well. You, you talked also about the shadow population because they kind of go hand in hand a little bit because the services that you are currently providing, and I say you as the royal you, as the municipality, and also <laughs> even the businesses there, um, the shadow population is is a factor into some of the services that you are providing, but also the ones that you're providing may be inundated by these underlying shadow populations, people who are there but are not being counted. Uh, I don't want to be rude and I don't want to ask the stupid question, but I'm going to kind of have to ask the stupid question a little bit here. How do you get the attention of a province of a federal government to say, we need help, we need support, but they don't recognize that the population of Fox Creek is higher than it actually is? Because even with a shadow population, it is still a population, in my opinion. Absolutely. So we've advocated with them. And this year we are actually allowed to count um, some shadow population um, in our census that we've decided to do. They are listening a little bit. There's big, there are requirements around it though. So it's not like we can go knock on all the hotel doors and count everyone in our community. That way they have, there's some rules around it where you have to be here for so long. Um, and at the time of the census, you have to also have 
um, an office here. So one of those things is that, you know, um, if you have a, if there's an office that um, is working here and you work for that company and you're here for so many days during our census time, we are allowed to count you. So we're predicting that it's about 400 extra people that we will be able to um, count. It's not as much as what is actually in the hotels or um, because it has to be in your town boundaries as well. Um, the office does. And um, so if it's out in the MD, the office part, we can't count them. But if they have an in-town office, we can. And so we are um, expecting about 400 extra people, which equivalents to just over $100,000 extra in funding, which does help. Every dollar helps when you're in a small municipality. Even the big municipalities, every dollar counts. What's the population of Fox? What's, and I, I, I have to ask this question correctly. What is the... Uh, uh, what is the on the papers population of Fox Creek today? I believe our last one was some uh, 1852, 1850. So this would bring you up to about 20, 2200 residents yes. if the, the numbers uh, go the way if, that you think. If that's what they are, yes. $100,000 is a pretty substantial chunk of change for a smaller uh, municipality. I don't care where you are. That's a big chunk of change. Yeah. Yes. Um, what does this mean? What will this help alleviate some of the, will this help alleviate some of the infrastructure issues that you're facing? Or do you have a, an earmark already set aside for a potential, I don't want to say windfall, but a potential increase in funding from the provincial government when it comes from uh, uh, this population, quote unquote, boom? Um. At this point, no, we have not discussed what we're going to do with the money, uh, but there is so many different things you could do with it uh, that um, it'll be it'll be an interesting debate when we decide, uh, you know, like most municipalities, the infrastructure and our sewer systems and lift stations and things like that need to be done. Um, we were in need of doing, I believe, one lift station and we're working towards our plans on that. Um, we did upgrade our water system in both previous to me being on council, and that made a huge di difference for our community. But as that money earmarked, no, not yet. Um, we haven't even discussed it, but it is $100,000 is a lot of funding for a small community. There's a lot of things going on in this world around uh, at the, the the state of the economy right now and people are struggling. And I can imagine you see this firsthand yourself when you go to the grocery stores, when you talk to people in your community, you, you, you hear their stories about how they're struggling. You have a direct impact on the, the decisions that you make have a direct impact on them, particularly at their pocketbooks. If I go to Fox Creek tomorrow and I ask them, ask 100 people in your community what their biggest issue is, they may talk about some of these issues that you talked about, service levels. They may talk about the shadow population that's going on, but they're going to give me some very micro issues that pothole that's in front of my house that that we need we need a new business we need this or we need that the very yeah. micro issues how do you as a council and you as a mayor balance the needs of the community against the needs of the individual because when people pay their pa property taxes they want to feel like their property taxes are going to help their community but also help them address some of their issues that they have in the community so how do you balance that aspect of the job um, that is a definitely a very interesting question and balancing that one is really hard because again, um, we can't do individual needs. Um, it is a community as a whole, uh, and trying to, trying to address what needs to be done. Potholes are huge. Roads are huge. Um, we, that is something that we are working on, uh, right now is. It sounds like you're speaking from that. experience as we're three yeah. days into spring here. As we're I know. <laughs> we, uh, you know, so we are working on a paving plan to start working on some of the residential areas for our community, but it is, it is hard. And I just always encourage people that they need to let us all know and on council what their needs are and what they want, but there's a want, um, a need, and then there's a wish. And we <laughs> wish for our community maybe this or that. And we, um, we, uh, it is a difficult 
balancing act. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a really hard question. It's a needs and a wants and um, trying to come together as a community as a whole, because we can't, we can't service just one person. Do, do people understand that? Do when you, when you, when you unfortunately have to let some people down on some of their needs and wants, because uh, I speak to municipal leaders and I hear all the time, the needs and wants are usually something big, something that costs $80 million, like an indoor pool, like this, that, or the other. When you approach people and they, when people approach you and say, mayor, I, 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 we want a brand new rec facility, or we want a brand new indoor swimming pool. Uh, you, you, you realize that municipalities only have a certain amount of money they can spend. You can't run into deficits. Is it challenging to, I don't want to say squash the hopes and dreams of a resident, but also, uh, you're doing it in some sense, but is it hard to tell people, no, it's unrealistic, or is there a way that you say it to people that gives them hope that maybe not today, but in the future, we could look at it if the entire community rallies around this idea? Absolutely. Telling somebody no um, is always difficult, um, but just trying to really have the time for the conversation is important so that you can explain it all um, and really have that true conversation about the decisions behind everything so that they know why we're making that and, you know, like, and being able to just hopefully um, add it to a future wish list, yes, but telling them no is very difficult. Um, but having a reason why, instead of just a no, with a reason with the no of, or it's a, right now we can't, and doing that kind of stuff. We are, again, I'm going to say we're fortunate. We do have a, we do have a swimming pool and a multiplex. Um, <laughs> so our residents are happy about it. So our concerns here, we have it, but they want to make sure that we, um, you know, they worry about the flip side of it, uh, what's going to happen to their taxes, because we have these things. So we have quite a bit of things in our small municipality that are that we're very, very fortunate. Again, we have a great MD that supports us in all of this stuff. So we're able to have that stuff. But it's a no with an answer. Um, I don't like a just straight out no, and to disappoint somebody but trying to explain why the why is important and i think people feel better when you can tell them the why behind it now i've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things when it comes to municipalities so i need to change up the line of questions here for a second because our, our my friend from brazo <laughs> county in alberta called me out on this and i've i've switched it up a little bit since i've had i had her on the show um what does Fox Creek do right. What is the thing when you go to Alberta municipalities, when you go talk to other municipal leaders across Alberta, what is the thing that you boast about when it comes to the uh, the community or even the governance in the administration part of Fox Creek? Um, so the number one thing for us that we can be super proud of is the relationship that we have grown with our MD. Uh, over the years, it has grown hugely and to be able to say that we have a true good relationship with them. And that is extremely important to let people know it can be done. Um, because I know that this is a huge concern for a lot of different municipalities that are trying to work together and it's just not working. So the MD of Greenview also has been super supportive of us and wanting to make sure they have that relationship back with us. So they are extremely supportive of different projects we've brought forward. As I said, they're a partner in our multiplex. Without them, we wouldn't have that. Without them, we wouldn't have um, a really beautiful fire hall and numerous other things. So that is a extremely proud of success. Um, story that we talk about. And for being a remote rural community, again, we are on that major highway, but there's not a lot around us, is really being, priding ourselves on that sense of community and trying to make sure that we're really helping um, as many people inside our boundaries as we can um, have the support they need. Our community is also young. I believe we're about 57 years old now. Um, we haven't been around as long as other municipalities. So um, just really having that true support. We are also um, trying to make sure that we 
grow our admin team the way that it needs to be to keep up with the day um, with today's standards and what the provincial government is requiring upon us and really having the right people in the right positions. Uh, they make us look good. We make the decisions, but we all know, or maybe some people don't know, but that staff is the one that make us council look really good. And so making sure we support our team and have the right people in those positions is huge. And I can't say enough about that. I would not be, per we talked about it a little bit earlier in the episode, but I want to ask just about the future here. We are one year from the last wildfires in Alberta, and it was described as one of the worst in Alberta's history. This year, the drought conditions in this, con this province are horrible horrendous. Uh, we declared a wildfire season early in this province. Uh, I, I don't want to say is Fox Creek prepared, but what's the state like in Fox Creek right now with what happened last year? Are you anticipating, and I, I know you should never anticipate, but are you prepared for any circumstance that could happen this year with the drier conditions that we are seeing this year compared to the previous year? Absolutely. Um, last year, we were worried. Um, we knew April was really dry. And so we were concerned. And you think you're kind of ready. Um, but you actually have no idea, right? Talking about it and uh, being ready are two very different things. Um, this year, they have been working very hard staff um, with council and we are trying to prepare the best that we can um, for everything there's a lot of things that are being done behind the scenes we're actually one of the things our community is doing that i'm super proud of the the admin team for putting together for us is we are doing our, our um, emergency preparedness event coming up in april 18th and there is going to be uh, Alberta Wildfire is going to be there. Greenview Search and Rescue is going to be there. Our fire department is going to be there. The school is going to be there. Um, we have insurance um, agencies coming. We have the banks coming. We are trying to put together the, a really big community event that we have um, a barbecue sponsored for. And just the information will be there for people uh, to hopefully help prepare themselves um, for it. It is definitely the talk of the community um, because we are coming up on that year's mark. We are dry. We are in a drought condition. Um, we did not have much snow this year. Uh, so our forest is definitely not had snow. We're hoping for the best. We're hoping it's going to start raining here in the spring and that uh, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, but we are preparing. We are making our plans and contingency plans so that we are prepared um, you know, we went to White Court last year. They were a very great supportive community to us, but, you know, they also live in the forest. So we have to make sure we are prepared and, and what we need to do and being able to get as much information out to people as we can. So they have worked on campaigns for, I think, since the beginning of January. Every Friday, there's information that goes out how to fire smart your properties, uh, do as much as you possibly can, what you, you know, reminders of what you should take what you should be looking at to take and making your family plans uh, so that you're prepared for what you need to do. And we kept all the fire guards that were put in around our community um, last year, the emergency ones, and we are working with um, forestry and we will be creating new fire guards around our community so that the fire department has an opportunity to get there in there and fight the fire. So, and I know that Minister Lowen and his team um, and the rest of the province have done a great job in trying to make sure they're prepared as well. And we're ready to go. We have um, a great volunteer fire um, department and they ha also have been doing as much training as possible to be ready for this as well. I appreciate the, the candor there, and I wish you the best on the April 18th event. Hopefully the community rallies around and gets out and learns more about how they can be prepared. And just speaking for anyone who's listening in Alberta, be prepared yourself, because uh, we saw last year it could be worse. So we, it could get, it can get extremely bad, and this year it's supposed to be worse, so always be prepared. Um, 
I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time here and I know you're a busy mayor of your community. So I've got to ask about my favorite subject because I've said, if you come to, if you come on my show, I'm coming to your community. So I'm coming to Fox Creek in May. So hopefully you're not evacuated and everything is great. And I'm going to be able to visit some of these great tourist destinations that you're going to talk about. But what are things to do? What are things that we can, that someone can do in Fox Creek for a day or two days? Is there anything that you recommend to a tourist? Because I have listeners from across Canada. Why should people stop in Fox Creek and what should they do while there? So we have quite a few things. Um, but if you're going to come to our community, one of the things that um, we promote on a regular basis is our Nordic Trail um, walking trails. We have fabulous kilometers of walking trails that you are out in you're right on the edge of town but you're out in the forest uh you can ride your bike you can walk um there's always people out there you're going to meet people you're going to see things there's fantastic views on these nordic trails we have a world-class um pump park i guess they're called like a bike park um okay I'm not sure if they're a pump park, it's a bike park. Um, and I'm gonna be in trouble for not knowing the right name. I should know the right name of what it is, but it has all the di different colors, diamonds. We have black diamonds, blue diamond, green diamond runs on this park. It is phenomenal, like it is huge. Uh, we have a, a playground that's right beside it. It's called Marnovic Park, and it's actually a local family that put this park together. It's all construction theme, and there's lots of different equipment in there. So there's a, one or two pieces of equipment that is the only ones in uh, Canada for these kinds. So it's a really cute, unique thing. Um, the Marnovic Company is a huge part of our, our history in our town, and their grandfather pioneered a lot of things with other residents in our community uh, to just make them happen. Like our golf course, we have a beautiful nine hole golf course. Um, it's easy to get on, it's inexpensive to get on, and it is a fabulous course that was some construction people that went out and decided they were making a course in our town. We have, and so it's a. That's it is the a ingenuity wonderful. that I love about small town Alberta. <laughs> if someone sees it, they will make it. it. Absolutely. So that is huge for our community. Uh, we have two wonderful lakes that are within 10 minutes um, that you can go camping and fishing and boating um on and they are a huge highlight for our community there are numerous other ones that locals do know where they are and you just have to talk to somebody and they can find this information out so there's lots to do if you want to be outside our community has outside and does outside extremely well we have a multiplex with a swimming pool field house, a walking track, a beautiful library, municipal library in it that has tons to do for anyone. And we, yeah, so there's pretty much everything and anything outdoorsy that you want to do. The winter time, we, we can't discount that one. We have huge winter um, tourism here as well. You can snowmobile right from your hotel. We have 250 kilometers of groomed snowmobile trail. One of the trails is part of the, like two of our trails is part of the Golden Triangle that connects us to Swan Hills and White Court. So you can ride between all three communities. So that is huge. You want to ride a snowmobile? It is a wonderful place to snowmobile. Um, so that's huge. You can ride, right, like I said, you can ride into your, right from your hotel out to the trails. You can come in and get your dinner, um, your gas, go back out. Um, it's, it's great. We have ice fishing, the Nordic trails, um, they groom. So you can either, yeah, um, you can snowshoe. They also groom our golf course for cross country skiing in the winter time. We have ice fishing at our lakes. And so there's lots to do that way as well. And of course, there's always hunting and fishing in our area if you're a hunter or a fisher. Um, so that's fabulous as well. Where do you go? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work, is there a spot in the community you can just go and decompress? Or are you like every other municipal leader I talk to and says, I just go home because after a long day, I just want to curl up and watch a TV show or a movie? So it varies. Um, I'm going to personally, um, depending what what it is, is I'm lucky enough to have two grandchildren that live in my community. So I usually spend time with them. Um, that is huge for me. But wintertime, we snowmobile. There's I have a favorite place on the trail that I just love. 
And so we do that. And in the summertime, honestly, going for a round of golf because it's so light out for so long up here. I grew up in Southern Alberta, so this was something different for me. And so you can still get a round of golf in at 7 p.m. at night um, in our community. So it's a wonderful thing to do. We, you know, we own our own little golf cart and we have sheds out there and we just go grab our stuff and we can go golfing. Um, so that is wonderful. And just honestly taking a walk uh, in our in our beautiful community and on those trails. You really forget that you're in town when you're on them because you're out in the trees. So I'm going to ask the million dollar question to end this interview. Okay. So we started by talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about your beautiful community of the town of Fox Creek. But in your opinion, what makes the town of Fox Creek such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, a little of everything. So it is, we are still a very small rural community. Um, I chose to move up here um, because I wanted my son to be able to ride his bike and walk to school and have that small town living that I grew up with um, that has changed so much in many communities. So that was first. And then that word in itself, community. This community, I had come up here numerous times. My sister lived here first and just how welcoming in a sense of they make you feel belonged here and they wrap themselves around you. We all become family. We, being that it is such a new community, there is, there's starting to be people that are truly from here. They were born and then they're raised here, but it wasn't that way in the beginning. So everybody came as a new person. So I feel that that's very welcoming and inviting and it, is just a great sense of community and family here. And we're very supportive, like many places, but I really feel it here. The other thing is that you get to escape the world. Um, when you live in such an outdoor community, you get to turn yourself off. And there's something for everybody. You don't have to be a huge outdoors person uh, to be able to appreciate the fact that we get to see and feel nature on a regular basis. And I think it's important to be able to have that. Um, we talk about windshield time and how long are you behind your, your windshield for your commute. My commute is two minutes to my house and I can go do anything within 10 minutes. You have a lake, you have a whatever you're looking for, a golf course, all that kind of stuff. So it's really important to be able to have a community that is like that where you can unplug from the world mayor i want to thank you this has been such a fantastic interview i i i always am in awe with uh, the caliber of guests that have come on the show you are now added to that list and i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come on and talk about yourself but also talk about the town of fox creek i'm looking forward to getting back up there and visiting and hopefully grabbing a coffee with you and you can show me the pump track and around all these great well if you want, we can go do nine holes because I I just love golf and I would love to get out on the trail uh, on the greens once again. So if you're up for it, let's go golf. And if not, I'd love to grab a coffee when I'm up in Fox Creek later on this year. Absolutely. I would welcome you with open arms to our great community. And thank you for having me. And we, we will go golfing. We can go for a little walk and then you'll come back in the wintertime and we'll go for a snowmobile ride. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all their diverse content covering everything from the issues on municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage from across Canada, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few months. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and as always, and most importantly, just keep talking.